is my very proud privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for this session, uh, General Zubair Mahmood Hayat, Nishan Imtiaz Military, retired, Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee 2016 to 2019. Uh, General Zubair has had a military career that spanned over four decades. Um, his key staff appointments have included, I'm just naming a few of them, Army and Air Advisor, United Kingdom, Director General Staff Duties at General Headquarters, Director General Strategic Plans Division, Chief of General Staff, Pakistan Army. In November 2016, he took over as the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee. In recognition of his meritorious services, he has been decorated with Nishan -e Imtiaz Military, Hilal -e Imtiaz Military, He's also the recipient of the Legion of Merit of Turkey, King Abdulaziz Medal of Excellence, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Honor of Defense Staff Italy. Here I'd really like for all of us to uh, give a, a huge round of applause for General Zubair. So after taking off his uniform, uh, after 43 years of military service, he still continues to give lectures on geostrategy, uh, nuclear matters and issues pertaining to defense and security. Um, it is my privilege to invite him to the podium for his talk on the geopolitical backdrop, sir. Auz billahi minash shaitwan rajim Bismillah rahman rahim I am delighted to be here in the Leaders in Islamabad Summit 2022. Thank you, Aswa, and thank you, Nutshell, for giving me this honor. I am aware that yesterday you had brilliant sessions and also this morning. And I hope that today's in the evening sessions also will be equally entertaining and informative. Trying to lay out the geopolitical context or backdrop in 20 minutes is like, try, like trying to play a test match in T20. But I'll try my best. And what I intend doing is, as I said, is in 20 minutes give you my flavor of the geopolitical context and then next about 10 minutes or so take three to five questions if you have any on the subject. So let me begin by just highlighting and cherry picking some of the key elements in the landscape of the geopolitical context. We are aware that we are passing through a pandemic of a proportion not seen in 100 years, 100 years. But we are also seeing and witnessing a war in mainland Europe after 75 years, after, after the Second World War for the first time. When I was doing my staff college, Camberley, United Kingdom, exactly 30 years from today, I recall that one of the fundamental talking points at that time was that Europe has buried war forever. Well, after 30 years, the history is back, and history is back with a vengeance. We have also seen clashes between China and India at the line of contact after 60 years. 1962 war. And so what you saw at Doklam or Galvam is not something that happens every day, every 10 years. It happened after 60 years. We've seen the United States uh, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, visit Taiwan for the first time after 25 years. We have seen inflation in the world grow at a rapid rate, and today the world has the highest inflation that it has seen in 40 years, and this includes the European countries. The 40 years war in Afghanistan starting in 1979 just ended about a year ago, and we are just seeing the aftermaths taking place, because it has been exactly one year to Taliban takeover of Kabul last year on 15th of August. And only last night you saw a major explosion again take place in Kabul itself, killing more than about 25 people. 
And last not but the least, in October after two years, notionally, the world will touch a population of 8 billion. And that's the highest population the world has seen since it came into being. Now, with this landscape, let me put up a framework. And the framework is very simple. The framework is a great power competition between two powers. That is between the United States and China. It is as crystal clear as it is. In this great power competition, there are to me two secondary players. One is Russia, the other is India. And there are other 20, I believe, nations of significance in this player, mostly in Europe, Asia, but also some now in Africa. And Pakistan stands amongst those 20 nations of significance. So therefore, a great reset is taking place. And center to this reset, as historically always, is the balance of power. Now, in this balance of power and the shift of it was clearly visible 14 years ago. Because at a double I double S meeting in Geneva in 2008, Henry Kissinger had said that the center of gravity of the world power has shifted decisively to Asia. That was said 14 years ago. Now, because the shift has taken place in some aspects, but has not taken place in two critical areas, one is military balance of power, and the other is political balance of power. Therefore, there is a element of chaos and disruption. And therefore, same Henry Kissinger, this month, while giving an interview to the Wall Street General, he has said that I am worried about disequilibrium. He said we are at the edge of a war with Russia and China. Who is saying this? Henry Kissinger. This month. He said we are at the edge of a war with Russia and China on issues that we partly created without any concept on how this is going to end or what is supposed to what it is supposed to lead to therefore it is no coincidence that the united nations secretary general mr guterres also this month during the 10th npt recon conference in New York has said that humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from a nuclear annihilation. Now, with this construct, and as I said, the primary contestation, as I said, between two powers, A, what I call as a status quo power and B, what I call as the emerging power. So in all primary domains of political, economic, military and technology, you see this contestation taking place. Now as far as status quo powers are concerned, they are upping the ante. You have seen Cord, you have seen Cord Plus, you have seen Eastern Cord taking shape. In the military domain, you have seen NATO, expansion of NATO especially towards the east, and incorporation of nations, which are in previous times were more neutral. You have seen a new AUKS taking place. You have seen development of new commands, the Indo-Pacific Command. You have seen the African AFCOM coming up. You have seen Cyber Command taking shape. You have seen Space Command shaping, taking shape. And also you have seen development and deployment 
both of laws, that is lethal autonomous weapon systems, and hypersonic weapon systems. So much is happening. But on the economic front, you see the status quo powers applying sanctions, and not to countries traditionally used to it, like Iran or Venezuela, but now, more importantly, and aggressively to Russia, and also increasingly to China. And last but not the least, the uh, status quo powers are actually flirting with a new form of currency in the form of digital currency, which will move away from the traditional base, both of oil or gold. As for emerging powers are concerned, they are relatively catching up on political domain. They have a construct called the SCO, of which obviously Pakistan is also a member. But in the military domain, you can see telltale signs of increased cooperation in development of hypersonic weapon systems, but also development and deployment of ballistic missile defense systems called the BMDs. On the economic front, they have the biggest ticket in the town, that is the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. But they also are evolving their own banking system, the AIIB being the central part of that strategy. In technology, they are now competing, and therefore you see Huawei uh, taking a leading role, you see 5G, 5G being contested, 6G now being deployed in China, you see artificial intelligence and cloud computing also in these powers taking place. Now with this pursuit by the two powers, Europe unfortunately has lost its steam and after Brexit and some other countries wanting to leave and the two central European powers also changing their strategic orientation, Europe is now increasingly leaning on the shoulders of the United States. Gulf, the bedrock of which was oil, because oil underpinned its political and its military and security context. Because oil is evaporating, maybe no more, in next 30 years, but more definitely decreased relevance in next 10 years. The relevance of Gulf is under question, and therefore you see new constructs like the Abraham Accord or the Abraham Accord Plus taking shape. But as I believe that some things in Gulf have not changed, like its geography has not changed, its Muslim character has not changed, its history has not changed, its culture has not changed, and therefore it will continue to have its place of influence. Of more immediate concern to us is our neighbors, like Iran, and you might hear news about the JCPOA in next about a week or so. If yes, it might unleash a different set of dynamics, and if no, it will again lead to a set of different dynamics taking place. But the way Iran has shaped up its relationships, both with Russia and China, is something to particularly note about. Now, a key word about India. And as I said, India I find as a secondary player in this great power competition. What India is trying to do is to evolve a new normal. India believes it has the power potential to do so. To me, that remains questionable. India is also trying to be the net security provider in the region. And therefore, you see India flirting with notions such as surgical strike. What India is confronted with is a 1,000-year-old challenge. In the shape of Hindutva and the RSS, the octopus that I call, that has engulfed, engulfed the Indian state. It is no longer the India of Nehru or Gandhi. It is now the India of Modi and Yogi. And therefore we have seen 
how India has actually uh, taken actions with regard to Kashmir, the 370L, the 370, the 35 Alpha, and how minorities in India, more specifically the Christians and Muslims, are being prosecuted and pushed towards a genocide. India is also trying to position itself militarily, and therefore this concept of linking Pacific with the Indian Ocean, the Indo-Pacific context, in this it has already engaged in major uh, agreements like the COMCASA, the COMCASTA, the LIMUA, the SISMUA. These are those foundational military agreements which India has actually crafted and has put on the table. But it is also acquiring massive arms. India has been the largest exporter, uh, importer of conventional arms for the last 15 years. But recently it acquired S-400 from Russia and any other nation, Turkey is the only other exception, uh, which would have acquired S-400 would have come under sanctions because of an American law, the, the CASTA. But obviously there is a waiver on that account and India is the only country not only that has acquired but has also deployed those weapon systems, the S-400. And interestingly, the deployment, initial deployment, is not against China. It is predictably towards Pakistan. So therefore, in this geopolitical context, the major underpinnings which drove the economies like oil, like gold, like human labor, they are on the recess. And new elements such as data, technology, and certain key materials are in play. So we are seeing the birth of a new world order. So let me try and conclude. And I ask three questions. Question one, can the theocide trap be avoided? Question two, will the things get worse? Question three, and finally, how, when, and in what shape, but more importantly, at what cost will the new world order take shape? But for myself, I've always believed that when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Thank you very much. So, um, if there are any questions, we have a Q&A session. So, General Zubair, if you would, I would uh, request you to if, please stay at the podium. I'll go down. And um, the floor is open now for any questions that you may have uh, from Sir Zubair. Sir. Yes, sir. Sir. Okay. I think the question that is asked is how well Pakistan is positioned to accept these new challenges. That's the question. You see, when I said Pakistan is a country amongst those 20 countries that are country of significance in this new world order, emerging new world order, that means that on the set table, when you sit there or you sit in the room, Pakistan brings to the table many capabilities and many strengths. But Pakistan also possesses many challenges and many vulnerabilities. So therefore, it is for us to optimize our strengths and to play our cards and to guard against our vulnerabilities. So the ball is there, the game is up there, it is for us to play. If we play and play it well, 
we can do it and do it well. If we don't, we can head to a disaster. Yes, please. So my name is Ali Jawad and my question is, is that even after there is so much awareness all around the world that what are the, uh, the harms of wars and violence, but still we see that all around the world there is so much hostility, the things going on in Ukraine, in Palestine, and other parts of the world. My question is that yeah, it, it breaks my heart to know that I feel helpless. I see these things. And I want to ask you that what can I as an individual do to contribute to global peace? Let me give you an eternal lesson of history. The best way to avoid a war is to be prepared for it. That's the eternal lesson of history. You see, even when there were three people, Adam and his two sons, they indulge in a fight. So if there are constants in human history, conflict is a constant in human history. While in a utopian world, you would wish conflict not to take place, but in the real world, you always have to be prepared for a conflict that exists under the corner. And because as I said, the fundamental question here is the competition between great powers and what is contested is the balance of power. Therefore, for me to say to you that what can you do, you can be a part of the nation and you can part of the humanity to make sure that you stand strong and you stand tall. But for you to think that there will be no war, I gave you the statement of Henry Kissinger, what he felt this month to say. Thank you very much. Please, sir. Sir. Uh, the economies play a more important role than the military power. Sir. So unfortunately, as we see today, uh, where Pakistan is placed, uh, one feel little uh, uh, depressed. So what are the way and what we can be the way forward to rise the economy of the country so that we are at par, particularly since that we are a, among the 20 important nations to play our role. Thank you, Thank you sir. My question, sir, my lecture today is not specific to Pakistan. I just gave a broader geostrategic overview. Obviously, I did cover Pakistan in that context. Sir, the <coughs> geo-economy, geostrategy, and geopolitics, these are three parts of the triangle. If you look at the strengths of Pakistan, which I spoke about during the questions, a country of 240 million people the fifth most populous nation on the face of the earth. According to a survey, the fourth most intelligent nation on the face of the earth. The fifth largest English-speaking diaspora on the, on the face of the earth. As far as digital, its connectivity is concerned, one of the largest digital connectivity which now matters for the future growth that matters. What you require is known to all you require basically fundamental corrections. If you don't pay taxes, if you, there are cartels which will actually hijack and have a, a, an extractive economy. So these are issues that are known. The strengths are there, the vulnerabilities are there. Per se, there is nothing wrong. It still has all fundamentals in place but never put together. That's the problem. Sir, man at the end. So my name is Adil Hussain. Hello. Uh, so my name is Adil Hussain. Uh, as the Taiwan issue is uh, emanating on the surface, uh, China and USA are facing, uh, confronting each other. So what is the position of Pakistan? Uh, what do you expect that whether we will go toward the US bloc or the Chinese Russian bloc? Look, I'll give you a position on Taiwan. There is no ambiguity on that. Taiwan is an integral part of China. 
and Pakistan believes in and will continue to do so in one China policy. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Muin Bartley. So this is a time of great change. Yes. And uh, now as the whole world is, is going through an evolution, so we as, as a, uh, maybe I, I guess you could say third tier country, part of the group of 20, we have to plan our, our own strategy, right? To best uh, position ourselves. So um, should we um, uh, sort of, uh, than an independent sort of a strategy where we keep all our options open or should we join uh, one block or be, be more inclined towards being a part or having linkages with one block or the other? Uh, you know, uh, what would help us in the, sh in the medium to uh, long, long, long run in terms of uh, what's happening in the world? Thank you. Thank you. You see, Sabzada Yaqub, whom I respect a lot late, may Allah bless his soul, used to say that leaders are those who can not only foresee, but leaders are those who have foreseen. So this question once looked back about 15, 20 years from now, in 2035 or 2040, people would have seen how the leaders of this country have played their card. What I did allude to, what Bugede Sahib was saying, was that we have the cards. We don't have to box ourselves into a position of no return. And a country of a nuclear power, the ninth amongst the nine nuclear powers, as I said, 240 million people, cannot be boxed, should not be boxed. For example, let's take energy and oil today. I mean, India today is buying 20% of its oil from Russia. Before this crisis began, India used to just buy 2% of its oil from Russia. Today it buys 20%. What stops Pakistan from actually going to Russia and getting not only oil and wheat on cheaper rates for our country? So we have the cards. We should have the will to play those cards. Thank you, sir. Sir. Good to see you, sir. Naeem. I'm Naeem Lodi, sir. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you very much uh, for a very illuminating talk. You raised very pertinent questions at the end of your talk, the three questions. I'm interested to know your answers to those three questions, even if they are, uh, you know, uh, temporary or whatever you feel like. Okay. So the three questions that I did raise, and as a good instructor, General Lodi has leapt onto those three questions. He doesn't want me to leave it to the guests. The first question was, can the Theocide traps be voided? My strategic sense <clears throat> is no. Second, will the things get from bad to worse? My question is yes. And the final question was, how and when in what shape the new world order will take place and at what cost? To me, the cost will be so immense that humanity has not seen since its birth. My answer, sir. Jasper. My name is Mohammed Asfar and my question is about the Russia-Ukraine war and the future politics after this war and the impact on Pakistan. And my second question is, what is your personal view about uh, the future of CPAC? I worked uh, with the Chinese government. I'm still working with the Chinese government. And there are many hurdles, barriers, but yes, there is a huge potential for both countries and especially for Pakistan. What is your view about the future as well as what should be our roadmap to uh, utilize this opportunity of CPAC uh, in the interests of Pakistan. Thank you. Let me tackle as for the second question first. I have always believed that CPAC is the future of Pakistan. 
and there are very cogent reasons to that. And in that, CPAC is a strategic project which brings immense strategic benefits to Pakistan across a spectrum of domains. And we require a national consensus and we require a political will to move forward on that account. And on that account, we must. As far as Russia-Ukraine is concerned, you have categorized it, categorized it as a war. That's not how Russia has categorized it itself. Russia has categorized Ukraine as a special military operations. Russia has not categorized it as a war. It is a conflict, most definitely. It will have repercussions. And we haven't seen the end of it. If Russia's security is endangered and continues to be endangered, we will see an enlargement of this conflict. But if Russia's security is guaranteed by means and other means, we will see an end to this particular conflict in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Ji, sir, we'll come back to you. Assalamu uh, Thank you so much for the session, firstly. Uh, my question is, so basically raw indicators of national power for Pakistan offer a poor reading of Pakistan's state's capacity and its viability. So torsion Pakistan to bound to experience if we allow ourselves to be driven and defined by a geolocation as a leverage in geopolitical, uh, which is inevitably the emerging great power competition. So in your opinion, should Pakistan not humble up and signal humility and stop posturing its location as a leverage? And, and, in, and take a more inward focus in developing human resource and resilience, uh, which should be our prime national goal rather than a calculus of proposing a location for rent seeking and or prominence. Okay. You see, this is a school of thought. I concluded by saying that when the going gets tough, the, the tough gets going. What you are telling me is that when the going gets tough, the tough should just lie down on a bed. That's the two fundamental equation. You see, this great power competition is not of my making. I have not created it. And it will not be wished away because I don't want to be a part of a, a regime. And as I gave you the three players, one of the major players, which is China, is my neighbor. One of the two secondary players that I gave you was India, is again my neighbor. One of the second secondary player that I gave you was uh, Russia, which is a near, near neighbor, if not a neighbor uh, per se. And the fourth major player, which is the United States, has been a constant player in this area. And as you can see from the over the horizon operations, that it carries out uh, in Afghanistan. So this is not something that I am making it up. It's a reality on ground and it's happening. And as I said, as a country of influence, we need to actually secure our vital interests. That is a must. If you don't want to be a part of that, you will have to sacrifice your vital national interests. Yes, please. We have time for That's just okay. one more question, please. One more question. One more question. There are four hands, so pick up yourself. So you'll I have to take a pick. <laughs> Gee, hello. Who is the youngest? Ekamudo Salim, <laughs> the youngest. I'm the youngest. Uh, excuse <laughs> me. Young sir. by heart. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, I'm Shahzad Malik. Sir, I'm here. So, sorry, sir. On your left side. Okay, okay, sir. On my right, sir. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm Shahzad Malik. Uh, to take the benefit of your great experience, I just want to say, when our political situ situation will be settled, and every government knows, as you discuss here, issues of tax, FBR, etc., will be resolved, and when we will say goodbye to IMF. I want to see that day in my lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.